<laughs> um, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jessica Gardner. Um, and as the University Librarian of Cambridge, it's my just an absolute pleasure this evening to be introducing this year's Sanders Lectures and to welcome you all. The Sanders Leadership in Bibliography, which is awarded annually to a preeminent scholar in the field, was instituted in 1895 with a request left to the university by Mr. Samuel Sanders at Trinity College. The series continues today with an annual set of lectures which we're all gathered for this evening. Our speaker, Dr. Will Noel, started out in Cambridge. He was at Downing College as an undergraduate, as a postgraduate, and also a British Academy postdoctoral research fellow in the history of art, focusing, of course, on medieval manuscripts. He's the author of several books, including The Harley Psalter, 1995, and The Ultrecht Psalter in Medieval Art, picturing the Psalms of David from 1996. From 1997 to 2012, Will was curator of manuscripts and rare books at the Walter Art Museum in Baltimore. While at Walters, he directed an international program to conserve, to image, and to study the Archimedes Palimpsest, the unique source of three treaties by the ancient Greek mathematician. A popular account of that project, the Archimedes Codex, which he co-wrote with Ravel Metz in 2007, won the Newman Prize in 2014, and was published in not one, but 27 languages around the world. Since September 2012, Will has been at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, where among other things, and there are many titles which we could give him for this evening, he is the director and co-founder of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. The mission of that institute is to bring medieval manuscripts, modern technology, and people together for the adoption of the learning of pen and around the world. And in that spirit, what's titled this series of Sanders lectures is the medieval manuscript and its digital image. Now his talks this year are the first Sanders lectures to have such a strong digital focus, I believe. And that's a theme that I think we'll see getting stronger and stronger through this series, and it's why I'm delighted to have Will here for us this year. It's also really timely for us as the University of Cambridge. We're on the brink of just over appointing the first dedicated professorship in digital humanities. And as a university library too, we're exploring what tools and what infrastructure to our digital library will need to support those future endeavors in digital humanities. And of course, a much wider agenda supporting open research of which the humanities will find. We too are a university library and a university with a global reach and a very strong public mission, which is why it's wonderful that so many people are here this evening. And I am for one certain that for me, and for many of us, there will be learning we take away from Will's talks, which inform both our manuscripts and our digital futures. So it's my great pleasure now to invite Will to deliver his first lecture on the theme of collections. Well done. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's a great, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And yes, I think I am. Uh, the first of, uh, of, of the speakers of the Sanders Lecture is to really focus on the digital revolution that's happening today. It has, of course, been happening for a while. And a lot of you know about digital images. And this makes me feel like, say, a printer in 1490 explaining to a bunch of scribes about the printing press. And I'm sure a lot of you actually know quite a lot about... Um, about digital images. Nonetheless, I do think that uh, we still are in the incunable age of the digital image. Uh, I actually think that uh, fairly soon, computers are going to be able to read digital images and transcribe them and put them online, and then we won't be in the incunable period anymore. Um, but right now, we're in the incunable period, and I think there's still quite a lot that we need to get right and that we're not getting right. So unlike the last time that I gave a lecture in Cambridge when I was doing my PhD and I was very nervous after, after uh, dinner at uh, Peterhouse and uh, Professor Christopher Brook was there and Professor Riley Smith was there and Professor Henderson, who was my PhD supervisor, was there. I actually think I have something to say today. So I'm, so I, so, so I'm, so I'm, so I'm rather, rather, rather excited to be here. Um, so let me... Let me start. If 
I were to write a book about the book on the left just by looking at the book on the right, the scholarly world would actually be rather dismissive <coughs> because I would be writing a book about uh, Carolingian Francia while looking at Anglo-Saxon England. I would be saying nothing very helpful about either culture. I would just be muddying the waters. This is the case with 99.999% of digital images on the web today. Uh, we invest a lot in describing medieval manuscripts. This is, a, this is a wonderful technical description, actually, of a Boethius manuscript. It's, um, it's Boethius's Latin translation of Aristotle's De Interpretatione, uh, and it's a 9th century manuscript with 11th century editions. Uh, and there it says, view provenance and subject details. There, it says, view the manuscript. Should we go and view the manuscript? I'm going to view the manuscript. There's the manuscript. Now, if that were the manuscript, of course, the right-hand side of this screen would be over a 1,000 years old, and the left-hand side of this screen would be slightly, slightly less than a 1,000 years old. Now, the thing is that although I can find out quite a lot about the medieval manuscript from this description, I can find out absolutely nothing about that digital image. I can't even find out when it was taken, let alone who made it. Now, at the moment, you might be thinking that that's a problem because if you're a curator, you know that physical things change over time and that, therefore, this, is, th this, this manuscript might not look like this anymore. But that's only part of the problem. The real problem... Oh, yeah, and I should say that I was a curator in Baltimore. I had a 1,000 medieval manuscripts to look after, I was very lonely. I know that you guys don't always go to the medieval manuscript. I know that you use digital images as source material all the time, and you do not know what you are looking at. You simply do not know what you are looking at. And for a, for a, for a discipline that takes looking at sources seriously, I propose that this is a problem. Now, when you think about a medieval manuscript... I want you to think of that as a medieval manuscript. So what does the digital image do? Well, at the moment, we treat the digital image as, uh, as if, well, it's just like a medieval manuscript, but it's, but it's not got some evidence. It's not got some things that medieval manuscripts have. So, for example, the, the, the digital image, it's quite, good on, it's quite good on senses of sight. But try touch. No, you can't do that. Try sound, no, you can't do that. Try smell, you can't do that. Try romance and nostalgia, you can't do that either. You know, the relationship between the medieval manuscripts and the digital image, they both have their distinct spheres. Those, those spheres overlap, and actually they overlap in interesting and complicated ways. But in order to understand how they overlap, you have to understand, when you're looking at a digital image, what it is that you're looking at. So I'm going to take a rather polemic example today and then, and then, and then generalise out from that. Hopefully, to redefine what it is that what we mean by a digital, digital collections and what it is that institutions should be collecting. Um, okay. In 1899, a guy called Athanasius Papadopoulos Kerameus, I'm going to call him PK, <laughs> catalogued uh, the manuscripts of the Metochian of the Holy Sepulchre in Istanbul. Uh, when he got to manuscript number 355, he wrote that catalogue entry. Now, P.K. didn't have tenure, and he was paid by the page for his work, so he tended to write rather long catalogue entries. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so he, he catalogued this, this, this manuscript, which is a palimpsest. So the main text is running down here, and the pa palimpsested text is running down here. And he, he transcribed two lines of that 
palimpsestic text as well. And these came, uh, and oh yeah, so to make a palimpsest, this is important. You, you disbind a book, you scrape off the text, you cut the conjoint leaves in half, you rotate them 90 degrees, you stick them in a corner, you do this to as many books as you want. In the case of the Archimedes palimpsest, there were seven or eight. And then you, and then you, and then you recombine the choirs and you write out, and you write out the text, so you get a book half the size, twice as thick, with the text running at 90 degrees. That's a perfectly standard way of making a palimpsest. P.K.'s description came to the attention of Johann Ludwig Heiberg, uh, and he looked at those two lines of text and he says, I know what that is, that's Archimedes' text, and it's in a book that's at least 400 years older than any Archimedes' text that I've ever seen before, and I should know because I've already done the critical edition of Archimedes. Now, Heiberg was professor of philology at Copenhagen. He did have tenure. So in the summer vacation, he went to Istanbul to look at the manuscript, and lo and behold, he discovered uh, two new treaties by the ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes, the founder of Western physics. One, the method of mechanical theorems, another a small text called the Stomachian, and also the only, only extant copy of On Floating Bodies in the original Greek. He was, he was blown away. Uh, and, uh, and so was the world, actually. <laughs> New York Times, 1906, the Savant discovers books by Archimedes, copied around 900 AD. Okay. So, never mind how, the book disappeared from the Metochion of the Holy Sepulchre, and it, <laughs> and it had a fluttering, it had a fluttering, it, it, sort of, it sort of occasionally appeared in the 20th century. Um, and one of those appearances was, uh, was when Nigel Wilson from Lincoln College, Oxford, boldly made the long trip from Oxford to Cambridge in the spring of 1968. And uh, he discovered that Cambridge Additional Manuscript 1879-23 uh, was a leaf from the Archimedes palimpsest on the sphere and cylinder. And uh, this leaf was uh, uh, sold or given, sold or given, sold or given to, um, <laughs> to the University Library by the executors of Tischendorf's estate. And Tischendorf, in 1846, published a book on travels in the Orient where he said he found nothing at the Metochion of the Holy Sepulchre except for a palimpsest containing some mathematics. So one can make one's own deductions. But that's just one leaf. The book was in a private, went into a private collection. And it was sold for $2 million dollars. And I found out who bought it. And I lied to the guy three times. I said I could conserve it. I said I could read it. And I said that I could image it. And then I spent 14 years of my life finding the people who actually could do this. <laughs> um, OK, so there was a problem uh, because the book had suffered very badly in the 20th century. Heiberg had taken photographs of the manuscript. They were actually lost, but we found them. The, book on the, the photograph on the left was, uh, this is the 16th page of the method that Heiberg found in the book. And it's on its side because he's trying to read text this way. This is the same page now. Uh, it has a gold ground forgery on it, copied on a one-to-one -one scale from, uh, from Henri Omel's Manuscript Grec de la Bibliothèque Nationale, published in 1928. It contains thalocyanine green, which commercially only, became, only became commercially available in Germany after 1938. So if we were going to do better than Heiberg, we had a, we had a job to do. This is Heiberg's uh, photograph of the one surviving page of the Stomachian, and this is the same page now. I don't know whether you can see, but it's got, it's got holes in it. Um, the holes are the result of mold. That's a scanning electron microscope, uh, because I had one showing you the bacterial pseudophili. Uh, but you can see perfectly easily that the mold is a problem. That's the purple stuff. The problem with, the problem with mold is that it, it eats away the parchment. So this is a, this is a microscope photomicrograph cross-section actually through one of Archimedes' <coughs> diagrams. 
And what you can see here is the collagen in the parchment breaking up. And the collagen is the stuff in the parchment that is the stuff that makes your skin both flexible and strong. So while most medieval manuscripts are ro reasonably robust, the Archimedes palimpsest is actually like tissue paper. And, um, and here we're trying to read the Archimedes palimpsest through this way. This book really, what really, really is, yeah, it's, it's, it's the definition of a write-off, okay? We're not, we're not, it's, it's reaching the end of its life. Um, the worst problem that we had was with the spine. Uh, I'm showing you, I'm showing you the spine of the book. <coughs> this stuff, this grubby stuff here, this is hide glue. If you're a conservator, you know, you know what to do with that. Uh, this, this, this bright stuff here, um, this is polyvinyl acetate emulsion with a high chalk content. Uh, so that's Elmer's wood glue. And this is tougher than the parchment that it's stuck to. And of course, if we were going to do better than Heiberg, then one of the, pla one of the few places we were going to do it would be, would be in, the, in the gutter. Where he, couldn't, where he couldn't see because he didn't disbind the book. We did disbind the book. It took four years, but we, we did disbind it. And, uh, and there is a disbound bifolium. But we are, we, are, we are very carefully, very responsibly packing this book to bed. So... Just before we put it to bed, we digitized it. We created the digital Archimedes palimpsest. And this, and this is what it looks like. And I hope none of you are sweating. This is, this is, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like a book, because my point is that it's not a book. Okay, it's a, it's a data set. And I'm now going to tell you and explain to you why we put out the data in this way. And I'm going to start with this folder here that says data. This is why we built the data as we did. Okay. It starts off in a galaxy far, far, <laughs> far, far away. Um, this is actually the Sombrero Galaxy. It's... 31 million light years away and 50,000 light years across. And this is how the world sees the Sombrero Galaxy. And actually, uh, it is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, I've got something very disappointing to say, which is that the universe does not look like this. It does not look like this at all. Uh, that image is, is, a, is a totally artificial image made up from real scientific images taken at different wave bands of light and then played with by an artist. That artist is a guy called Zolt LeVay. And he is responsible for how the whole world sees the universe right now. <laughs> and uh, I worked with him and some graduate stu undergraduate students at Johns Hopkins University to put on an exhibition of uh, his images at the Walters Art Museum. Uh, the, they're man-made creations. Medieval manuscript uh, multispectral imaging is done in exactly the same way. We take images from different wave bands of light, actually 14 of them, in our case. If you look at a, an image under a different wave band of light, you see different things. So, so here, this is on the ultraviolet end, and I can see some text running horizontally. And here, on the uh, infrared end, I can't see anything running horizontally. This is actually a good thing, because what I'm going to do is stack these images into a data cube and uh, play on the contrast between the two. So here is an image... And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm, of the palimpsest, and what I'm going to do is merge them together, okay? Uh, so I put bright parchment with bright parchment, and I get bright parchment. I put dark prayer book with dark prayer book, and I get dark prayer book. 
but I put bright parchment with dark diagrams and dark text running horizontally, and what I get is an image cue which makes the diagram far easier to see and the text far easier to see. Okay? And that's what they look like. They're not pretty, but they work. You zoom in, and you zoom in, and you zoom in, and you zoom in, and you zoom in, and, and you can read it. Um, sometimes it's like magic. But I can do something else. I can subtract one image from the other. So I subtract bright parchment from bright parchment, and I get zero. And I subtract dark text running this way that I don't want, and dark text coming this way, and I get zero. But I subtract zero from one, and I get one. And that way, I just see the undertext and the diagram. <laughs> and, and, and this palimpsest is the, uh, is the oldest source for the uh, di diagrams that Archimedes drew in the sand in Syracuse by about 400 years. And Archimedes <laughs> thought in diagrams. Um, so they're really crucial, crucial evidence that Heiberg himself uh, wasn't, wasn't interested in. He, didn't, he, he, got, he got a mathematician to reconstruct the diagrams rather than, rather than observe the diagrams as they were drawn in the manuscript. Uh, with the multispectral imaging will work normally, but it won't see through gold ground forgeries. Uh, for that, you need you need you need you need much more much more powerful much more powerful electromagnetic radiation, much shorter wavelength. And uh, I wanted to include this image because I'm right next door to the Cavendish Laboratory. So, 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 an X-ray comes in, it knocks an electron off the inner shell of the a of the Bohr atom, as it were, which disappears into quantum space. And when it does so the electron from the second shell will jump into its place, made a quantum leak into, the, into this place, and when it does so, it will shed electromagnetic radiation, and it will shed electromagnetic radiation at the wavelength specific to the element that it hits, because what makes an element is its unique elemental setup. So we took it to a little X-ray tube, we stuck it in. There's lots of calcium from the parchment, but there's also some iron, right? The thing is that you have to map it. You, ha you can't just stick it, you have to map where the iron is on the page, and for that you need a much more powerful light source. We wait, went to the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory in California. Uh, out comes the most powerful light source in the solar system. Zaps Archimedes, and obviously we were very careful. Um, <laughs> and this is, the, this is the detector that picks up the images of different wave bands of light. So, and if I show you the iron, then I can show you the undertext underneath the gold ground forgery. Now, um, I'm not saying it's not difficult. Uh, in fact, because the parchment is transparent now, you've got four lines of text, not two. The post-processing is difficult. It's, it, it, it's, it's processing by the centimeter. It takes a long time. But it is the unique source for Archimedes' method of mechanical theorem. So it is worth it in the view of Nigel Wilson from Lincoln College, Oxford, and Revy Elnets from Stanford University in California. And those are the people that mattered. So, so how do you know that I'm not ju just not making this up? How do you know that the Sombrero Galaxy is 31 million miles away, speeding away from us at um, <coughs> 1,000 kilometers a second, um, and it's 50,000 light years across. You don't know unless you're given the scientific evidence, unless you're given the data. And you are given the data. You're given the data openly by the Welk Hubble Legacy Archive. You can go and put the data in a shopping cart and get it. And that means that if you want to, you can, see, you can recreate how Zolt LeVay made his pictures, but you can also use that data for all sorts of other interesting scientific purposes. We decided to do exactly the same thing. 
if, if our images were going to believe these in, entirely handmade images, then we had to show the data that they were being used from. We had to show it at full spatial resolution, and uh, we had to present it in a way that anyone could just grab it. And if they wanted to in the future, they could process it using new algorithms to, um, to try and do better than we had. So that comes down to files. It has to come down to files because you can't put out full resolution images on the web as, as, as photographs. Uh, it won't, it, it'll take too long to download them. So you put them, put them out as files, and then you put up every single image you take. And these are all the images that we took, and we make them available as JPEGs, very low resolution JPEGs for easy consultation, but also as, oh, you know, uh, 85 megabyte images and, and higher. These are actually rather low res because these are x-rays. Um, but 80, 85 mega, and, they, and they've got MD5 checksums. But it's dull, it's boring, okay? But that's the only way to get the information across. And each file has all its technical metadata. So I know exactly who took this image, I know when it was taken, I know, uh, I know who paid for it, I know its spatial resolution, I know its date, I know everything I can possibly want to know about this image and more. There are very, very, very few images on the web of medieval manuscripts that do that and make it available to you. And this is a fundamental problem. And that's why we put the data out like that. One of the things about creating a data set is that it's an intellectual exercise. It's not obvious what goes into the data set. So you have to curate it. You have to say, okay, I'm going to make a data set and I'm going to determine what goes into it. So what goes into it is not just the Archimedes palimpsest that's currently in a private collection in America. What goes into it is the Cambridge leaf. Of course it does. And what goes into it is not just the uh, Archimedes palimpsest, but the photographs that we found in the Royal Library in Copenhagen that go into it. That is now an integral part of the data set because that was the evidence that was used for the scholars to do their work. And now we come to the scholars. Okay. The scholars are not the data. The scholars, I'm afraid, are supplemental. I'm very sorry, sorry to you all, but, uh, but the scholars are supplemental. And the reason that they're supplemental is that they are, in a sense, a map of the, a map of the data. They tell you what evidence is where. They're descriptive of the images that we took, and they help you orient yourself. Now, that's not... That's, that's what they are, sort of, as a, as a place in the data set. And they're very dull. I'll show you them in a minute. Um, but the story of them is not dull. Uh, Reviel Netz and Nigel Wilson were, were uh, transcribing the Archimedes text. This is an email he sent in 2001. In a couple of months, the first intellectual fruits of our labor will be published together with a complete transcription of one crucial side of one page, most of which is unknown to modern science. I send you the final lines of the article as it stands in draft form. It is understated. It reads as follows. To sum up, then, the new reading from Archimedes' Indivisibles proof should call for some reconsideration of the position of Archimedes in some key areas of the history of mathematics, especially the two related conceptual fields of the calculus and of infinity. N not an email that you get every day, and, 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 and not an email that I'm going to explain now, because uh, I'm not a mathematician. But this is, an, this is easier. This is... Um, with the help of the images, we were able to, uh, to, uh, to make changes in the reading to Archimedes Stomachian and to come up with a new hypothesis for what Archimedes was doing. Uh, everybody knew that Archimedes was uh, playing with this square, and the square is made up of 14 pieces. But what could Archimedes be doing with this square that could be interesting? Not sure. Reviel Net suggests that he was actually finding a way in which, finding out how many ways you could recombine those pieces and still make a perfect square. Now, we only have the first page of the treaty, so we don't know the answer, um, but we calculated the answer. 
The answer is actually 17,152 divided into 536 families. And this, is, this makes it a very early treatise in the history of combinatorics in, in, in Western mathematics. So behind these dry transcriptions is actually a, well, an extraordinary amount of hard work and intellectual labor that in this case, I think, was at least provocative. But if you remember, I said that there was more than the Archimedes manuscript in the Archimedes manuscript. It was, it was made up of seven or eight manuscripts. So Natalie Chernetska sent me this email in 2002. I could identify uh, the text of a Greek orator unknown otherwise. I could identify parts of lost speeches by Hyperides, uh, containing a fragment against Timandra and another speech against Diondas. Now, Hyperides is not a household name now. Uh, he was one of the ten canonical orators of antiquity. Uh, Photius, when he was describing all the books that he could find in Byzantium in the 10th century, said, uh, said that he'd found a Hyperides manuscript, but, but no one believed him. Uh, but they were wrong. He did. And I don't know that this one was it, but this is the only Hyperides text ever to have been found in a codex. Now, this is turning into something rather extraordinary because this is both, both a unique mathematical manuscript and now I've got a, now I've got a unique rhetorical manuscript as well. Uh, June the 11th, 2005, from Nigel. Excellent news. The hard drive and photos came safely this week. At first glance, there's no more Hyperides, but several leaves of a philosophical text, on one of which I read the name Aristotle clearly enough. <laughs> okay, so clearly for Nigel Wilson isn't clearly for the rest of us. It's sort of... <laughs> It's sort of, sort of around there. There it is. And at this stage, lots of scholars got to work on this thing. Uh, here, we are at the, here we are at the British Academy. And this turns out to be a... Uh, I should tell you how naive I was. You know, when they, when they, when they, when they discovered the Hyperides, Natalie Chernetska said that this was not in the TLG, and I was disappointed. Um, so, so, so this isn't in the TLG either, uh, but it turns out to be um, a lost commentary on Aristotle's categories, uh, possibly by Porphyry, but probably by Galen. Uh, there's Nigel Wilson and the late Bob Sharples working on it. Uh, you know, um, there's a confession, which is that I had a lot of people making a lot of images, and a lot of scholars were working very hard on this book, and it took seven years for us to find the colophon at the bottom of page one. <laughs> and, and this is the colophon. Uh, it's a, actually a map of all the iron on the page, and it says that this book was written by Johannes Myronas on the 14th of April, 1229. The 14th of April was Easter Saturday in the Greek Orthodox Church. This was about six weeks after Frederick II releases Jerusalem from... Uh, Muslim control. So this is when you make a palimpsest. You're not out there, you know, looking for sheep. You're not. So what are you doing? Revy Elnets made a suggestion that works for me, which is that you go to a great library, and in times of crisis, you preserve your core. So what are you going to save your soul with? Are you going to save your soul, soul with, uh, with Euclid? You're going to take Euclid? You're going to trash your Euclid? No, I won't trash my Euclid. I need my Euclid to count. I'm going to trash my Archimedes. Am I going to trash my Demosthenes? No, I'm not going to trash my Demosthenes. I need Demosthenes to learn how to speak. I'm going to trash my Hyperides. And am I going to trash my Galen? No, I need to mend my leg. I'm going to trash this commentary on Galen. Okay, so... All this stuff goes into what looks like a very boring data set. And, and we've got the Archimedes transcriptions, the Aristotle transcriptions, together with their mappings onto the page. And this is just XML. This is the, f the XML is very long. These are all the contributors. There's the XML. Uh, and here is the grid. Sometimes I wonder what I did on the Archimedes Palimpsest project. I can tell you that I did do these mappings in image J. Uh, and, uh, and I'm proud of that. Um, so, so that is the, that is the scholarly work. 
OK, so we wanted this data set to survive. And we were doing this, actually, in a museum. How, are you, how do you make sure this data set survives? Well, NASA is down the road, so we went to see a guy called Don Sawyer. And Don Sawyer was leading the development of the archive reference model that NASA helped to create after they lost those, those footprints on the moon. And uh, Don Sawyer told us about three things. He said, for goodness, sa for goodness sake, make it cheap to maintain and make it simple. And, um, and, and document everything. And have no links, because the links are going to break. Okay? So this is the file saying documents. And we did. We documented everything. Uh, we had external documents and we had internal documents. So the external documents, for example, there's the TEI, but somewhere here, I can't see it now, is the TIFF specification, right? TIFF's pretty standard, but we've got a copy of the TIFF specification in our documents. Internal documents, well, the most important one is the Archie software architecture, which tells us the... the how we, how we process the images so that anyone can dig it out and, and redo it. Okay. Research contrib. Uh, you make a data set. It's done. Someone might make additions to it. That's what you hope for. Uh, so you have a space where they can make, uh, make additions. So... There's a guy called Gabe Weaver who did some, did some work on the diagrams and actually to, in order to read the, uh, the Galen commentary on Aristotle's categories, um, uh, we had to, it was harder and harder and we had to do more and more imaging and we added some later. Okay. And then finally at the top, um, I'm just showing you what you actually start with, which is a readme document. Uh, which is a, uh, a document that explains everything about the data set and how it's put together. And the most important thing about this document is the rights and conditions of use, right? And the Archimedes Palimpsest is released under a li with license for use under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 unported right access. This means that anyone can do whatever they want to do with this information. Now, the aim of the owner of the Archimedes Palimpsest was to make that which was unique uh, ubiquitous, that which was expensive, free, and that which was fragile, safe. If those are your motives, then you need to give your stuff away. So, what was the destiny of the Archimedes palimpsest? It was conserved, it was put in frames, and I don't know what its future is. I can tell you that it's very well looked after right now. We published a book with CUP that, was, that had transcriptions and images of every page. But I have to tell you that in order to read what's on the page, you can't use those images, right? They won't work. It's not going to work. Don't try, even with a magnifying glass. You need, you need, you need the data set. And that's why we created the data set like this. So. Data sets are boring. From now on, I'm just going to call them fridges of data. <laughs> and the idea of the fridge is it's a self-replenishing fridge, right? Because this is one thing that, that images do that medieval manuscripts don't do. They, they replicate very easily. This is a fridge of data where the ingredients are first generation, full resolution, the, image at, the resolution at which they were captured, and they're beautifully labeled so you know exactly what they are. And the door to the fridge is open. You can just take it. You don't have to tell anybody. OK. So the owner of the palimpsest has, a, the owner of the palimpsest has another, another palimpsest. Uh, this one is a, uh, an 11th century Syriac palimpsest uh, prayer book with... Um, with a 9th century copy of Sergius of Reshana's uh, trans Syriac translation of Galen on simple drugs. Uh, it's a unique manuscript, other from six leaves from the same manuscript in the British Library. Uh, that's what it looks like. 
We imaged it. We put the data on the web. Think fridge, OK? It's just like, just like the Archimedes, but think fridge. Um, and we told Syriac scholars about it. And eventually, uh, led by Peter Paulman and Sian Bayro, they made an application to the Arts and Humanities Research Council of Great Britain and got a grant for a million pounds in 2015 just to exploit the data set. There was no guarantee that they were ever going to see the original manuscript. But the data was really good data. They could do exactly what they wanted with it. They were treating it as, and indeed it is, a, an original resource. We all met, actually, in 2016 to look at, the look at the manuscript itself. There's not much point. Uh, you really can't, really can't see much. What did happen was that because the Syriacists all got, all got interested in this really very important manuscript, is that Gregory Castle found, ma found leaves from the same manuscript uh, in St. Catherine's Sinai, in the Houghton Library, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and in the Vatican. So we went to image them, and we included them in our data set. Of course we included them in our data set even though they're in five different institutions around the world. They're unique resources of fundamental importance. So then we turned our attention to the illuminated manuscripts of the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. There you are. Think fridge. And there is, a, there is an illuminated manuscript from the Walters Art, or an image of an illuminated manuscript from the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. We did it in exactly the same way. And you might be thinking, hang on, but they're different. There's a difference between an illuminated manuscript and a multispectral imaging thing of the Archimedes palimpsest. I am saying to you that they are exactly the same. They are both 21st century captures of medieval stuff. And you want to uh, document them both extremely well and make that documentation of the 21st stuff available. Now, I don't care whether you consider this a secondary source or a primary source. You might want to think of it as a secondary source. You might want to think of it as an image of a medieval manuscript. And, uh, and that's absolutely fine, as long as you don't treat it as a medieval manuscript. As long as you say, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a 21st century object, it's a secondary source, and just like any other secondary source that I use in my writing, I'm going to cite it. I'm going to say at least author, title, date. You can't do that right now. You can't do that on the web right now. I also actually have absolutely no problem with someone treating these things as primary sources. I really don't. I mean, to me, this is just another step in the, trans in the transmission of a text. Goodness knows, most medieval manuscripts were copies. This is just another copy, right? In fact, in this case, it's um, a totally unedited text called A Dream of Bounton Duty that was dedicated by a guy called Michael Archer to Queen Elizabeth I, and it's at the University of Pennsylvania. I don't think that you need to go to the University of Pennsylvania to make an edition of this text personally. As long as you tell people that actually you were working from digital photographs, and then, of course, you have to tell them which photographs you were working from. And at the moment, you can't. And even if you could, and you say, Will, but actually there is a place on the web, you know, there's a permanent URL. Even if you could, so you go there, and you still can't tell anything about the photograph that's there. And by the way, it's not going to be there in 10 years. Everything, every digital image, needs to have, its, needs to have a description. It needs to have what's called technical metadata just as a medieval manuscript needs what's called 
descriptive metadata. They're the same thing, except that one applies to a medieval manuscript and the other applies to a, a digital image. So what we wanted to do was to open the stacks of the digital library. And what we propose we should do is open the stacks of the digital library. And I've got very good news. You can do this. All this information, it's buried in these libraries, right? Because when you take images, the camera catches all this stuff. It's just buried. And you can, and, and you know that image of the, med of the curator of manuscripts who's jealously guarding his stuff? That's not our problem anymore. It's the geeks. The geeks are jealously hoarding all this information that we need in order to be responsible scholars. OK. Let's just say, then, that we can imagine a world where you have really good digital assets that have their own authority, have their own identity as separate and individual things. Then you can reimagine what a collection is, OK? So do you, do you actually want to digitize your own holdings? I mean, why? You've got them already. Why not digitize somebody else's holdings? They're, they're of research value, these things. Uh, so um, one of the real problems of the digital world, and there are very, very many, is that some of the really great books of the world are in places with absolutely no digital infrastructure. So uh, why, why not digitize those things and host those things? This is a guy called Benjamin Fleming. Uh, who was a fellow at the Schoenberg Institute of Manuscript Studies, and he uh, worked with us, and he got a British Academy uh, Endangered Archives grant to digitize the manuscripts in the Bangladesh Library at Ramamala, which is indeed endangered. The water table's about two feet below there. So he digitizes them. They go into the Endangered Archives um, program at the British Library, and we all also host them on our website at Penn because we have a very, the largest collection of Indic manuscripts in North America, and this adds to, our, adds to our holdings. Now, the case there is kind of simple because you can treat the digital objects seriously because you're worried, of course, that the original is going to get waterlogged and soaked and melt away. So that's an excuse for taking the digital object seriously. But do you need to take the digital object seriously if, if, if the medieval manuscript is going to survive? Well, yeah, you do. Uh, and one of the great things about treating digital objects as research objects in, and cultural objects in their own right and making them freely available is that, is that it's worth other institutions to take them over. So there's Stanford University, right? Uh, is very interested in medieval manuscripts. It hasn't got many itself, but of course it was deeply invested in the imaging of the Parker Library. And then it was interested in building something called Triple IF, which I'm not going to say much about today, but I'll say a bit more about tomorrow. It's a wonderful thing. And um, the trouble is that they, because the Parker manuscripts were then under copyright. They're not now, Alex. Uh, they're not now. It's wonderful. They're free. But they were under copyright, so uh, Stanford couldn't use them in their IIIF experiments. But they could use the Walters Art Museums. The Stanford thing was quite expensive for them to do. The Walters Art Museum, they could just ring me up and say, hey, can we have your data? And I can say, hey, you don't need to ask me. Just take it. And that is what happened. Their lawyers couldn't believe it. I actually had to sign a legal form, <laughs> but whatever. And of course, the Walters Art Museum is an art museum. It's got no digital infrastructure. It can't, it can't look after this stuff. It's far better off in the Stanford Digital Library. Where it can be triple IF'd, where it can be seen with other manuscripts, and indeed with Van Gogh for that matter. This begs the question, 
what should an institution collect? And that's an interesting question. You know, um, one of, a great pioneer of digital medieval manuscripts is uh, Professor Stephen Nichols at Johns Hopkins University. And he is a, uh, a world expert on the Romance of the Rose. And he got a large grant from the Mellon Foundation to build up the Romance of the Rose website, which is about 280 Romance of the world Rose manuscripts from around the world, various different institu institutions, including the Bodleian Library which is great, and I hope this website survives and is loved and is curated, but the truth is that Steve is retired now. Who is really going to love and look after this data as it should be loved and looked after? It's a question, and it's a question that institutions need to face and academics need to face. And one possible solution is to create an entity that isn't dependent on any one individual, is within the infrastructure of a library, uh, which is endowed, which can have a mission that extends beyond the person, any one individual, so that they can have a mission to curate data. And that's what happened um, when Lawrence Schoenberg and Barbara Bristol founded the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age. So we have are open portal, primary digital resources available to everyone. From 32 institutions around the world, from the Huntington Library in California to uh, the John Rylands Library in Manchester. Everything on there is a free cultural work. You can take it, you can do what you want with it. The Archimedes manuscript stuff is there, the Walters is there, uh, the Galen is there. There's about uh, 7,000 manuscripts and 65 terabytes of data for anyone to do exactly what they want with. Uh, yeah, 32 institutions. Uh, as it's, it's listed by institution, but it's also, it, it's also listed by, it, they're also curated collections. So, so the illuminated manuscripts of Philadelphia, you can, you can get those, or the manuscripts of the Muslim world, you can get, you can get those. Uh, the licensing is all straightforward on the up and up. Uh, the most important thing is that it's machine readable as well as human readable easily. So you can just get this by anonymous FTP or rsync and we'll tell you how to do it. You are in a fundamentally different position from this because you can be. You now have primary sources of information that are properly sourced, properly documented, first generation and full resolution. So what we need to do as institutions is not digitize our own collections and project them onto the internet as virtual silos of ourselves that don't interact with each other. What we want to do is have a whole galaxy of, uh, of possibilities. And we do that as institutions by making fridges of open data. You might be wondering how you are going to use these fridges of open data. They don't look like books to you. OK, so you have to come back tomorrow, I'm afraid, to find out. <laughs> but but I would say, I just, last week, I did a search for Illuminated Manuscript Quran. I just did a Google search for Illuminated Manuscript Quran. I was pretty pissed because I was beaten to first place by the British Library. But all the single leaf pages here, all these, all these things are from the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. And this is 10 years after we imaged them. They are by far the most accessible illuminated Qurans on, on the web. So somehow, by some kind of magic that I'm going to talk about tomorrow, you can get to the point where your images are frequently used and frequently discussed. So uh, I need to do a colophon. Um, the money uh, came from the owner of the Archimedes Palimpsest. It came from the National Endowment for the Humanities. It came from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Council for Library and Information Resources. It also, and importantly, comes from the institutions that 
host this data and make this data. This does not come for free. Most of these grants are matching. And I'm not talking about the money tonight, but I'm happy to have that argument with anybody. It's not a reason to charge. So these projects are deeply collaborative projects, but, um, uh, but they're not anonymous projects, right? I mean, one tends to think of data sets as anonymous things. They're not, they're not anonymous things. And there should be, there are lots and lots of people who are involved in this, but some of them should actually be on the stage with me. Uh, so I need to talk about them. The first is Abigail Quant, who conserved the Archimedes palimpsest. Uh, then there are the people that made the data. So that's uh, Keith Knox, Roger Easton, uh, Bill Christens Barry, and uh, Uwe Bergman. And then, and then there are the scholars. And there were lots and lots of scholars. I should say that, um, that the mum and pop of the operation were the late Her Eric Handley and Pat Eastling, who's here tonight, which is just a delight. Um, but lots and lots of people. Uh, were actually from, from Cambridge. Uh, David Sedley, uh, Reviel Netz, Natalie Chernetska. Uh, it's amazing how much, um, how much uh, Cambridge, the Cambridge classicists really re rallied around and, and helped to do this, which is totally awesome. And that's not to say that Nigel Wilson from Oxford and Laszlo Horvath and his crew in Budapest weren't hugely important, and Chris Carey from London, and Richard Sadraj Sarabji from I don't know where. I mean, there were just lots of them. But Cambridge was vital to the success of this project. Now, the other thing is that these kinds of projects, and one of the real issues with uh, digital humanities projects in general, is that there's no one to professionally program manage them. And, uh, and the management of, what the, of these incredibly intricate pro projects uh, was by Mike Toth, who's in the audience tonight. And uh, without him, we'd have been totally stuck. And he particularly championed the Syriac data and engaged the Syriacists in him. And these are the types of people that don't normally get the recognition and are t so totally central to the operation. And finally, there's the guy who actually made and put together these 21st century assets, who's a guy called Doug Emery. He is the program an programmer analyst at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. He didn't just do all the data sets that you see here. He also did the Sinai Palimpsest multispectral imaging data sets. And he is a great cultural icon. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to him. Thank you very much. Thank you.